All right, here we go. Recording. And yeah, so I am, my name is Talis. I'm a co-founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization called Crew. And Crew uh, builds an online platform designed to help amplify social movements and education programs all around the world. We, um, we have, we're very fortunate to work with dozens of organizations who mobilize communities and use our platform to basically onboard them, training, connect them, connect their members, volunteers, teachers, parents sometimes um, to support them in achieving the mission of each of their organizations, right? Whether it's raising money or um, mentoring kids in high school or training young people as social entrepreneurs, we're kind of a like a backbone technology to making these programs um, a reality, especially nowadays with you know everything becoming digital. And one of our member organizations actually is the Institute for the Future, uh, based in California. And we have with us today Dylan as our guest speaker. Hi, Dylan. Hey. And uh, Dylan is a director for their tenure for forecast uh, program, and we were very uh, fortunate to get to experiment with them um, as they also were thinking about how to run uh, their multi-day in-person event that they run every year in the Bay Area into an online experience. So we, uh, they were already members of, of Crew and host on the Crew platform, their different uh, member organizations. And uh, of course, the people from, from those organizations as a, as a place where they can find their research, uh, resources, and so on. And uh, actually, I'll stop here, Dylan, just to hear, maybe it'd be uh, good to hear from you if you wouldn't mind sharing about what is Tenure Forecast, this event that you help uh, lead and, and direct. And yeah, just a little bit about what's, what was your approach like when it came to redesigning this, this, this experience into an on, online event? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so the 10-year forecast is the flagship event of the Institute for the Future, um, which is um, the 50-year-old, the longest running uh, strategic foresight organization in uh, America and, and we believe the world. So we've been for about 50 years, we've been, um, we're a nonprofit. And so we work with governments and organizations and the public to try to help um, structure more systematic conversations around long term thinking and around future possibilities and empower people to recognize their agency in creating the future. And so that's what we do. So our tenure forecast event is our, our annual event. We've been doing it for decades in different formats. Um, and up until this year, like with everybody else, uh, I'm sure th this has been an in-person event, right? This is sort of our one time of the year. We bring everybody together. We bring our community together. We bring our sponsors together, our different partners. Um, and we do this like really kind of deep immersion into future possibilities. So I've been running that, um, we're producing that event for about eight years now as the lead producer of it. And you know, one of the things that we've always kind of prided ourselves on um, up, up until this year, and then, you know, the, sort of leading into the decisions we made was that we really wanted to make it sort of a very immersive and experiential event. We wanted folks to have experiences and, and to sort of form memories and have impressions. So we've over the years experimented a lot with different kinds of venues to do that. We've, we've hosted this event in the last few years on places like aircraft carriers and in museums and in interesting places that are kind of suited to sort of unorthodox conversations. And we bring in a lot of artists and exhibits and we, we often have kind of theatrical elements that are woven throughout it to try to provoke different kinds of thinking about future possibilities. Um, so this year, when we were obviously confronted with the pandemic, we had planned on having the event at this place called Asilomar out in California. Um, and we're doing early planning for that. I was actually at the venue where we were going to be hosting this year's event back in uh, mid-March, like the, the, a couple days before California's lockdown. It was like the same day when the, the, the stock market first had that huge precipitous drop. It was uh, a very strange day to be walking around the venue. But anyway, so, so obviously, yeah, like everybody, we were confronted with this huge challenge. And so when it became clear after a few weeks or six weeks or whatever it was that there was there was no chance this event was going to happen in person, we started making our preparations for how to do it remotely. And we had a little bit of lead time. So we started planning this in around April and then we delivered it in September. And um, I can actually, if you'd like, I actually did find a deck um, that I can share that sort of 
uh, talks through some of these things if you um there you go interested in that okay great yeah go ahead um and so, and you can stop me at any time, Tally, but I, 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 sort of, I can sort of just talk through some of the, the big beats of what we did, right? So mm -hmm. we, the first thing we did was we recognized that we wanted to, um, we didn't want to kind of present this as like a compromised in-person event. That was like the first thing that we realized. We were like, okay, so we have all of these, uh, you know, our research sponsors, all these folks, there's, there's a lot for a value in the event for us that is, that is delivered to our partners. Um, in addition to being a community gathering event. And so we were really aware that like just delivering kind of like, you know, our big fear was like doing, and, and that's not, nothing to speak of the current format we're in, but we knew everybody at that point was working in Zoom. We didn't want to just do another series of Zoom calls and call it an event, right? That was our, our big thing was thinking like, we don't want this to just feel like the thing that everybody's kind of already getting a little bit tired of. Um, as this thing that's normally this escape for people, right? It's really interesting and different to talk about the future um, and to be together in those spaces. So, you know, we we started to talk about how do we make this, um, how do we think about the benefits of this format? How do we lean into the constraint that we're in and think about what can be better about it? So we started thinking about not just how do we make up for the value that's lost from the last lock of an in-person event, but how do we actually bring more value than they would normally get and have that be what people experience so one of the ways we did that was, you know, and we have different sort of cost models, everybody's kind of um, thinking different things, but normally we present all of our, our research sponsors uh, with three tickets to our in-person event, right? And that includes a lot of fixed costs of things like eating and um, food and seating and hotels and creating experiences at scale. And so the first thing we did was think, okay, let's, let's expand that out. We know we're going online. We know a lot of what we're doing is gonna be inherently more scalable. So let's offer 10 tickets to all of our partners. And then we, often have a, an issue in our events where it's a, like we pack a lot into the three-day event. We try to cover a lot of ground. We try to do a lot of things. And often we get a response that people love it. It's very immersive. It's very stimulating, but they want more time to kind of process it. And so we, ex what we wanted to do was create more time, which we could do because of the nature of the remote event. So we extended it from normally two, three days to two weeks, which uh, to be honest was probably a little too much. Um, I, I, we, we had really good engagement throughout that time. But I think it, it was, you know, if we, when we do it again, you know, we, we ended up with two weeks of content, five days of what I'll get into in a minute of kind of a, a different way that we handled content that I think a lot of folks are doing. Um, but we had sort of the main thrust of the event was that first week for five days. And then we had um, kind of insight sessions and more opportunities to gather in smaller groups to process what people had heard and to work with it in that second week. And so overall, I, like I said, I think that worked really well. I think we probably could have brought that down to just a week. Um, but it was very successful overall. And, and it really addressed a lot of that feedback that we often get. Um, we also, um, you know, one of the other things that was interesting about it from a, just a perspective of who can attend this event was we really wanted to lean into the accessibility that the digital um, offering creates, right? It's, our events are normally in California. I, I live in Austin, Texas, um, but our organization is based in uh, Palo Alto. So our events are usually in the Bay Area which is a beautiful destination from the perspective of people wanting to go somewhere to a conference and that kind of way of thinking, but is, is not necessarily the most accessible thing, right? Obviously it's not, uh, not everybody can hop on a plane to California to an attend event. And so we had limited uh, the kinds of folks that could actually join us that we were able to open that up and we were able to open up what we were experimenting with as kind of a free tier, right? Normally there's some kind of cost associated with the event that we have to bundle in different ways. Um, but we were able to open up a more public tier that we hadn't been able to do before that was a part of our mission as a, a nonprofit that we'd had a hard time reconciling with the cost model before that. And so we were able to really open that up. Um, and we were allowed to um, invest in some digital platforms with the effort of, of moving the event, right? Sort of our, a lot of our venue costs got translated into costs in, into digital platforms that we can continue using. But we also experienced a 40% cost savings over previous year's events. So, we were able to make the event bigger and longer with more people and, and only spend about half as much money, um, which was great, you know, right? So once we started thinking this way, leaning into that, it was, um, it, it became really clear what, what kind of benefits we could see from this. Um, and so, so then we also started to think, um, and again, feel free to interrupt me if you have any, any questions or anything, Tally, but um, you know, the, our next question was like, how can we really lean into what's only possible with a virtual event. So obviously there's benefits specifically to a, a virtual event, but how do we make it not still just feel like 
okay, this is, you know, uh, there's these benefits, but it's still um, just an in-person event that, that didn't get to happen in person. This is a picture from the previous year's event in 2019. Um, which we had in the Craneway Pavilion, this beautiful venue outside of uh, the Bay Area, you know. So we're used to this big, dynamic kind of space. How do we how do we not lose that dynamism? And so what we did is we we thought about okay, so the medium of online platforms, digital platforms, is not going to be a medium that can replace being in person in a room with tables with people. But what this medium really is more like this medium of like what we're doing right now is is more like. TV, right? It's like we, we all have a familiarity of l watching content on screens that we've grown up with um, that has a certain way of doing it that's very different from in-person events. And so we reframed our entire event um, about partway through as a, a live TV broadcast um, and, and really a live interactive TV broadcast. So rather than thinking about it uh, again as sort of a series of sessions, that allowed us to rethink of it as a series of shows. So this was the TYF like TYF TV, right? And it ran for a week. Uh, we we created, instead of sort of 30 hours of sessions, we had 30 hours of programming and we had six hours each day over those first five days. And we divided our different content tracks, which would normally be sort of framed in a certain way as shows. And we created them with their own identities. We, we created sort of a scheduling for them. I mean, obviously not everybody necessarily has access to this. We're not a, a huge organization by any means, but we're not tiny, we're kind of mid-sized. Um, we have about 40 people full time. And so we, uh, we have some design staff and, you know, you can see these things aren't crazy elaborate, but just a little bit of work on creating some, some graphic design that suggests the idea of shows that in our case lent itself to the different topics we wanted to cover. Um, we also, and, and this was something that was, I think we spent about a thousand dollars on, which, um, you know, is, is not a, a ton or a little bit, but one of the, the things we did was we, um, we're broadcasting over YouTube Live. And so we needed to own the assets of everything we were doing, we, and, and particularly with music. So we also had the opportunity to hire a composer who created an original theme song for us. That's like a, a real banging tune that everybody loved. Um, and, and to create little kind of theme songs for the shows as well, which again was, you know, it was like a couple days work for this composer. Uh, it was really fun for us. And it created this like kind of this sense of adding the special back into it, right? So we, we started to allow us to get out of the things that we're losing and more into the things like, what can we gain from this? What can we actually benefit from by creating this kind of unique identity, both for the event and for the individual content so that people were also kind of, you know, and I think especially just with COVID that there's sort of a nostalgic comfort to like, you know, it's like when everybody's sick and they have the day off and they don't want to think, what do you do? You like, you lie down in your bed and you watch TV all day, right? Like, the, which isn't to say that that's what we were trying to create uh, in terms of uh, energy, but we wanted this to feel comforting in a world where everything feels different and alien, right? And so by leaning into this familiar form factor um, and turning it into our purpose, uh, I think it really accomplished that. We, we were actually amazed. We, we had, you know, six hours of programming back to back of different shows for five days in a row. And our engagement across that stayed remarkably high. We, we like barely, we expected to have a high attrition rate. Um, and we had a little bit of attrition as you would expect for any long event, um, but it was remarkably high. We kept like 80% of our audience that entire time. I think just because it was, you know, and it allowed us to do things like have little fake commercials between the shows um, to do things that were like fun and, and interesting. Um, and uh, we had different hosts, we had different kinds of things that were happening. I'll get more into that, but. The, the one thing that the, this did require for us to do, which is a cost consideration, um, and, and there's different ways to do it. So we wanted to really nail this out of the park. As I said, this is a big fundraising opportunity for us as well. We wanted this to have a really good experience. So we invested into a, um, into a, a company that does um, uh, like video broadcasting essentially. So like a, a digital video switching company that we hired to help us to pull this off so that we could create an experience that again was more customized that where what was on the screen in terms of the layouts of how things were set up in terms of the ordering of the shows in terms of you know and we we had hundreds of different people that were hosts or panelists at different times so that allowed us to have kind of a virtual green room and to create an experience both for our participants and and sort of a sense of security on the other end of it that we were going to deliver something really consistent Again, there's, there's different pieces of software you can use to sort of do that kind of thing. So it's not gonna fit everybody's use case, but in our case, it really allowed us to kind of get that really different feeling out of the experience to hire this crew to, to think of it more like 
uh, it's the same kind of crew we would hire, you know, that you would hire at like a Broadway play or something, right? That, or a group that would be um, working in the behind the scenes of a live TV show that's doing this kind of switching. And um, I was directing the show. And so I was on the Zoom, kind of a, this digital intercom in a Zoom room with um, our kind of six person streaming team um, for the entire time, sort of directing the show, right, with them. And so it did take that little bit of extra work, but I think what we delivered really did accomplish our goals of being um, sort of substantively different and kind of a, a different level of experience than than what would happen if we we just kind of stayed within Zoom. Um, and and then this is where kind of Crew came in. So this is where we, uh, the Institute for the Future, is partnered with Crew, and particularly in the Vantage uh, partnership that I'm the co-director of, which is our foundational research program. Um, but also now in our training program as well, this is, it's had a lot of organic adoption within our organization as people have seen what it can do. That we, we had been using Crew already as the back end for our community management. Um, so our, our partner portal is what we call it, Vantage Point, um, is running off of a Crew back end. And it allows us to organize our teams to deliver research, to deliver different kinds of things. And we worked with Crew uh, throughout the event, or before the event really, and throughout to um, create a new view for us. And I know this is um, sort of a, a big thing that is going to become available in different formats for other crew organizations. Um, oh, I did, did you switch away from me? I guess I lost. Tally, I think, I think you yes, took over I from me. I you to show um, okay. the live, the live uh, vantage. Can you see? Yeah, so, so we, it allowed us to host the event on, on vantage point, which is what you're looking at here. So we were we actually hosted the event on our partner platform where we were trying to gather all of our folks um, anyway and use that new view. I don't know if you have the view up, Tally, but um, to be able to um, go into uh, yeah, let's see, here's the daily ceremony. Yeah, so um, yeah, if you want to pull out the agenda there um, on the side, so you can see that um, yeah, so that every day of the event was structured like a track within Crew. And it was kind of like a TV guide listing, right? It was sort of like from each hour, what is the um, what event is happening? Uh, crew worked with us to create these really great features where when you first came to the crew dashboard, it would show you a little thumbnail of the, the current session that was happening. You could click right into it, or you could go into um, any of these sessions. The platform actually moved everybody along. So that red dot represented where we were in the event at any given time. Um, and then it moved people through the event uh, the other huge benefit that this had for us was normally, and I'm sure this is true for everybody else doing in-person events, it's like we really struggle to do a good and timely job of recording our um, uh, sessions and sharing them with other folks. You might want to stop playing that video tally because you're not optimized for video streaming, so it looks pretty choppy through the Zoom. Got it. Um, but um, we, uh, yeah, we were able to not only deliver the content in real time on this platform, but we were able then to archive the conference in place, like pretty much in, in, in on the same day anyway, so that folks who were coming from different time zones, which we have a lot of participants from all over the world, we were trying to straddle different time zones, but we're kind of more squarely on the Western hemisphere. And so this allowed us to, for anybody who was coming in that night and we saw this activity on our dashboards, they were able to come in and, and, and re-experience the event for themselves at their convenience, right? So it, it made both a real-time and an asynchronous experience possible. Um, it also had this real-time chat built in. We were able to use the crew features of adding the materials related to each session, whether they're the PowerPoints that were being used for a presentation, you could download them right from within here. Uh, whether this is a, a, a session that my colleague Dane McGonigal did each day around our daily ceremony um, that really allowed us to um, yeah, just, just have it so that like, as soon as the event was done, the archived version of the event with a really nice experience to access it with all the materials you'd need was just already there and done in the place where we wanted it. So just the power of that alone um, and the, the time saved on that, you know, is genuinely incredibly beneficial for us and um, a huge signal internally that we want to move more in this direction. Uh, this, was, this was really successful for us. Um, I, I don't know if you want to say anything else about crew on that end, or I can I can go on a little bit more about some of the other things that we did tell you. you. Yeah, I think it would be great if you want to share more about um, other things. I don't know if you want to share on your end, or we can switch back and forth if you want to show like Miro or Icebreaker or anything else. Yeah, yeah. I have that on my end if you want to if I, I can okay. take the share back. All right, so. Um, so that was kind of the basic setup of it was that we started when we were hosting on crew, we were doing it like this live TV show. 
but obviously we don't want it to just be like a TV show. We don't want it to be passive. We want it to be really interactive. So we, we brought in a few different tools um, that, we, that we hadn't seen a lot of people using, some more than others, honestly. Um, but uh, we wanted to bring a suite of different, kind of what we thought of as social experiments, right? Because these are new things that most people haven't tried. And so we, we had that spirit to it. And so obviously, so Vantage Point, this, the crew um, instance that we're using has this built-in chat they created for us, this real-time chat. So that allowed us in, to have that kind of the Q&A, the, all of the kind of back and forth that you would want with participants during the session while still um, getting out of the, um, the restrictions that Zoom has on how many simultaneous participants you can have, right? So you can't, there's no platform right now, Zoom included, where you can have full interactivity with more than 500 folks at a time. Um, and so uh, we were able to use this kind of YouTube live broadcast sort of capability that is sort of theoretically infinitely scalable without any cost to us, um, which is crazy. You know, you can just broadcast through YouTube live for free to as many people as you want. Uh, and, but we were able to use Vantage Point to then have everybody who's in there watching it in, in the crew instance, chatting with each other as well. And, and the great thing about that is, as everybody knows, when, you're, when you are done with a Zoom webinar, like with this one, whatever's in the chat disappears afterwards, right? You lose it, it just sort of disappears back into the ether. So what we were able to do by locking these things all into place with their own spaces on crew was preserve that chat. So everything that happened, all those dynamics, all those interactions are, are there for anybody to go back and look at. Um, so people were sharing notes with each other, they were sharing other references, they were connecting with each other, they're using the chat features to meet each other. So we did that. We, we also, we had this experimental platform called Now Here that we had a, uh, we were actually the, the, their launch partner for their launch of their alpha, which is worth looking at. I mean, it's a really hard thing to Google. It's called Nowhere Now Here. It's this kind of play on words, but it's this third party platform. That's what I was trying to reproduce was reproduce those kinds of ambient kind of hallway conversations that happen in conferences, you know? So when you go to an in-person conference, there's sure, certainly a lot of value in going to the individual sessions, but for a lot of people, the primary reason they go is to be in the hallways outside those sessions and connect with other folks that are there, that networking aspect. So we wanted to create a few different ways to try to facilitate that. Now here was one of them. This is kind of like a cross between Zoom and like a 3D video game. It's a, a thing where you could go into the space that they created for us. That was a 3D immersive space and you can move around in it like you would in uh, you know, like Minecraft or something like that. You could move, use your keys to move around, see other people. And there's a few spaces that do this. There's things like for Bella and different things, but, but most of those use these kind of 3D avatars or cartoonish avatars of the person, which are cute and have their place, but don't get you that sense of like intimacy that you would get from talking to a person face to face. So what Nowhere has is the avatars, the, the way that people show up in this digital world is that it's their, it's their like Zoom bubble. It's like this, what you're seeing right now. It's my face, you can see my expressions, you can see the sort of, um, you know, you can do a lot more of that kind of uh, human reading that you would do face to face, um, but you can do it in this 3D space. So if you were moving closer to somebody else, you would see them talking, you would hear them more as you got closer. So you could kind of cluster in different groups, people could have different conversations. So that was a really interesting experience that was, uh, you know, felt more social and, and less kind of, um, functional, right? Um, uh, not that it wasn't functional, but it, but it had that social edge to it. So that was one we did. We also used two existing platforms that you might have heard of between each session. So we had, as I mentioned, these sessions were structured like TV shows. So we created a 10 minute gap of commercials between each show so people could get up, go coffee, bio breaks, all that stuff. Um, and during those, we offered these icebreakers, which is this uh, sort of structured speed dating kind of service um, that uh, recreates a kind of table buzz for us. So we could sort of throw out, you know, often in an event, we'll end a session and we'll say like, turn to a partner and, and here's some questions to prompt discussion about what you just heard and how it strikes you and what you think of it. It's really important, a big part of these events. So this kind of allowed us to recreate a little bit of that was that people could go into there, they go into this kind of other digital space and they get randomly paired up with somebody else who went in there. And then the creator of each session could create little insight prompts that they could sort of respond to and kind of a like chat roulette kind of interface, but just for the, the attendees. So if you wanted to like meet people or network, right? This was one way, another way we offered that. Mm. And then the, the way, fourth so way. We have a yeah. question from, from, um, from Marty. Did people enjoy icebreakers or was it hard to get the engagement going? Icebreaker, I would say of all of these, I would say icebreaker was the one that we had the least consistent um, engagement with. 
Um, I think that was partly though how we, a lot of how we implemented it. I think it was more on us than on Icebreaker um, because by putting that into that 10 minute space, which was the breaks for the event, I think we under anticipated how much people really wanted those breaks. Um, so, in a, you know, because people were, you know, we weren't sure if people were going to just tune in for a couple shows. We, we also wanted it so that if people could only join for an hour here or two while they're working or doing childcare around that, we wanted each session to be more standalone. And I honestly anticipated more people would come in and out. And so these icebreakers wouldn't be the only break they get. But it turned out that most people watched the whole thing. And so they needed those breaks. And so they didn't engage as much. Um, and so that's something I think we want to experiment more with because it's it's a decent platform. There's There was a few people that struggled with it. It's like early, like a lot of things that launched this year. It's not something we own. Um, it's something that we uh, enlisted for this purpose. And so we found that about 20% of people that used it had random technical issues related to their browser things. You know, it's like not quite as robust as crew itself or, or some of the other platforms. Um, but um, but the, I, yeah, so I think on that one, it's something that we still believe in conceptually, but we would implement differently to get better better data on, on answering that question uh, in the future. Um, I think the people that did do it enjoyed it. I mean, it's a very intuitive interface. And um, I think there's a lot of these kinds of speed dating things that go around now that are people are developing sort of a literacy for. And so it's nice to provide an outlet for that. Um, but yeah, like I say, I think we, we we should have created more, probably fewer and more pointed opportunities to use it. I think if we did it again. Um, so Dylan, there's a couple other questions if you don't mind me asking. Sure. sure. Um, another one was, um, how uh, what was the commitment level and how do you ensure people register and actually show up to participate? Um, yeah, so let me, let, let me answer that by just quickly get, finishing this point and getting to the next slide, which okay. was another big component of that. Um, so the, the last uh, social experiment platform we used was Miro. We offered it as a kind of a community board uh, to our partners uh, and to our participants rather, um, and created a, a space for the event on it. And this was the one, this was the opposite of icebreaker. I was expecting Miro to be a little, because it's kind of a heavy interface. Miro is like something that you don't really want to dip a toe into unless you're going to go all the way in. Um, it's like using like an Adobe product or something. It's just got a lot going on in it. And so I was anticipating that would be a barrier to entry for people, but I was wrong about that. That was, Miro got huge engagement. Clearly there's a lot of people that have been using Miro. Sorry, what's that? I'm gonna show you your Miro if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, and you're a nice breaker there right now. Yeah, so I wanted to show you. So basically part of the, which kind of, I know you're gonna answer this too, Dylan, but I would say that a big part of continuing engagement, especially as you were using a lot of, you know, a couple of other different tools online, was that you had your one online hub, right? Instead of creating like yes. a web page or some kind of landing page where people would find the sessions and the links and everything, you already had your community on, on Vantage, which is your crew platform. And then all you did was send out invitations. People were either already here or they created an account for those, for example, free guests had temporary accounts with two to three week access. Um, and yep. then here you would be guided, right? Each day had its, we call it a track, these little cards. But in this tracks is what I showed you earlier. You you could see the different sessions of the event and, and the resources, the chat, everything. And everything about the platform would guide you to the current session from this um, banner, um, yeah. banner, we had a, a pop-up banner that would like push you into the next session so you don't get lost in other pages and so on. And then we also integrated the other tools that that uh, Tenure Fork has used into your platform so that again, this is like your online hub, this is where you walk into your event, right? So it's the hall, yeah. The community board takes you to Miro. I loaded it before just because it takes a second, but you can see here, um, Institute for the Future created a, oops, uh, different kinds of experiences and boards and conversations and reflection uh, topics on each of the sessions, which was, um, yeah, just another cool way for members to come in here. You can see this, introduce yourself. Yeah, a really, really neat tool. Yeah, um, and, a, and a lot of our participants lived in the Miro boards, um, and that was that was the sort of persistent space which, yeah, like you say, we wanted, we didn't want to dilute the experience by promoting too many different platforms. We were worried that people would get a little bit, you know, like too many tabs open and then you just move on to something else. Um, and so we we kind of de-emphasized Miro a little bit by by putting in that community board button and not 
like prominently featuring it, but it, people found it and they loved it. And so, yeah, so I think mm -hmm. as an addition to, it certainly didn't replace anything that Vantage Point was doing uh, or crew, but it was as an addition for the event. It, it I think it, it had a huge amount to do with people's experience of feeling like they're there with other people because mm -hmm. it is this collaborative thing. You can, it's actually fun watching when people are adding insights, you see everybody else's activity, right? It's got that Google Docs kind of yeah. uh, simultaneous activity piece to it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's really so I, mm -hmm. go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you want to share back, I, I was going to switch to the future readiness package because I think that was the other oh, yeah. big thing yeah. we did that, that made a difference. Sounds good. And, and Icebreaker, by the way, if anybody wants to check it out, it has a free tier. This I'm showing you the free tier right now, but you can create basically like a hangout room with, like Dylan was saying, prompt questions and you can join with video and you would be, you know, see it like you're seeing here and then you can get paired up with folks or join a group conversation. So yeah, just another cool um, cool technology that you can integrate into whatever portal you're using to host your event. Back to you, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the other thing we did, um, and this gets back to that question of how do you invite people? How do you get engagement? How do you get people to stay? So the other thing that we wanted to do was we, there's so many things about the event that are physical and we and and the remote aspect of, of our lives now is is like made everything so abstract feeling and we didn't want that and so we committed early on and it was a lot of work but it was one of those things that really provided like incalculable value like it sort of made the experience a little more it sort of transcended its limitations I think um, uh, in this way was we dedicated ourselves to creating a physical package that we would send to our uh, our, our VIP participants, which in our case meant 500 people. Um, and we, we opened the event up to much more people than that. That, that that's just, I mentioned that free tier earlier. This was the thing that was sort of the biggest distinction in that free tier was there was a physical cost associated with this, but it was so worth it. People loved it. So we, we created this box and we created it with this air of mystery around it. It has a sticker on it. You can see in the video on the left, which was one of our promotional videos for the event that says, please do, do not open until September 14th. So people who registered for the event, who either on, were on a paid tier or were one of our research sponsors, uh, those 10 folks up to each organization, uh, they all got this physical package in it and, and it, it, this tantalizing thing that told them that they could not open it. And so I think just even that, getting a box in the mail that says you can't open it until the event happens. And when you open it up inside, it tells you the instructions come from the event. So it drove a lot of traffic to our opening session because people now are like, okay, I got to solve this mystery. I've got this thing in my house. Um, how do I use it? I've, this is the only way I can find out. So we, we did that and there, there was a lot of goodies in there. There was like our research materials, the things that we would have delivered to people anyway. We also um, created these mystery items for this daily ceremony. So we created these for each day of the main part of the event, Monday through Friday, we had a mystery item that was in a special little box um, that was sealed up and that we used, we found these really great um, like recyclable materials companies to get packaging that we didn't feel um, as guilty about because it was all very, it was all made out of recycled materials. Um, and we were able to create these items and each item was designed in our case to transform a physical sense. So we really wanted people to have a physical experience. And so each day when they would open up the box and in this daily ceremony, which looked like what you see on the left with uh, my colleagues, uh, Toshi Hu, uh, who runs our Emerging Media Lab and Liza Bender, um, that they would, we would open it all together. So we would have this daily ceremony where we all opened the thing together and then everybody did the interaction of it at the same time. And there's something about that, creating rituals where you just have a group of people do the same thing at the same time and infuse that thing with meaning uh, the, all of the experiences I've had doing that blew my mind at how effective it was. It, this is like the secret sauce, I think, to events is to create rituals. Um, and so normally we do that in different ways in person. In this case, we had things like, and they were like pretty trivial-ish things, right? In terms of like the actual logistics behind it. One of the event, the things was um, we had these miracle berries, which are this thing you can order online that is this kind of weird sort of berry that exists. It's just a berry uh, that you can get in sort of a distilled form. Um, and you put it in your mouth and for about half an hour, it changes your sense of taste so that sour things taste sweet. 
And it's a kind of a, it's just a very strange experience that most people haven't had. So we had everybody take out these miracle berries. We invited everybody's kids as well. This was a kid friendly part. We wanted to lean into the fact like, hey, we know you're working at home. We know that this is not, you know, the professional facade we're all trying to hold is like particularly artificial right now. Um, and so bring your kids in, bring these miracle berries, pop them in. We included a lemon packet, but we encourage people to bring their own lemon. And all of a sudden this lemon tastes like lemonade, right? And you can have this experience everybody had together. They're all chatting about it together. And it just felt like a thing that happened to you that day, as opposed to another Zoom meeting that you were a part of, and that you were a part of this group of people that were doing that. And we did that with, we had one where we had these, uh, these um, chrome adept glasses that are kind of like 3D glasses that make everything on the screen look 3D. They're sort of a, they're very cheap, right? These are all items that cost like less than a dollar. Um, and we created materials in the broadcast that were in 3D for that, right? So just things that it's like your senses are experiencing something. We, we had scratch and sniff stickers on, on one of the days. Um, and I brought my kids in and we, we were trying to smell things and, and guess what those smells were all together. Just things that engaged people in their physical experience of the world as well as in their tangible and people like it was so popular that um, we got so many messages about this daily ceremony we had people like creating their own like fan videos of their experience of it we had people just like gushing about it was just it was an escape from the the covid for a moment you know and and something that we could do together as a as a community um it was a lot of work so we created you know you can see on the right we had this socially distanced layout in our office to like acquire the materials curate pack the boxes send them out to all of our participants 500 of these but uh we would we would do that again that would that was a, a really and that and i and i think that was the key to getting so many people who registered to remember to come to it because it wasn't just a tab in their browser it was something that they had physically been receiving um so i don't know if there's any other questions at that point tally but th those are sort of the big like that's the, the end of the my kind of like big feature set of what we tried to bring to this event to make it special yeah thank you dylan i think um Something that I really enjoyed in during your event was besides the daily ceremony, that first activity that Jane also led each of the times, I feel like you had in particular, maybe two of your sessions were highly interactive where there was a, a quick presentation or a scenario presented and then a series of questions asked to the participants that were answered via chat and, and the presenters kept presencing that chat into part of the dialogue. I, I thought um, that was done really well. I don't know if there's anything you want to add as to how you all designed those sessions. Yeah, so that was a big part of that. You know, it's funny, the daily ceremony, which was the first show on each day, it was this hour long show that started each day. It was a show that I think probably people coming to the event thought the least about. They, they weren't coming to something because they saw something called daily ceremony show up on their calendar. But it, I think it was the most meaningful and it was because of the, and it made the whole event work because it created this vibe that the whole rest of the event got to um, benefit from. Part of it was the day, this ritual of this mystery package, as I mentioned, but every day, as you say, right after the package came out, Jane McGonigal uh, would do this session that was only 10 minutes long or so. And it was um, the first five minutes into the future. And it was another kind of a little bit of a ritual where it was an exercise that was a thought kind of a, you know, brain sort of um, uh, what we call it, like uh, ice breaking kind of uh, experience at the beginning of an event uh, or the beginning of a day where it just encouraged people to think a little differently, to open their minds up into thinking more about the long-term future. She had a prompt that she would present. She's very charismatic, right? So she was a great host for it as well. Um, and, and that was the other thing is like coaching people for these events, right? We have a lot of folks that are really good at in-person events or being on a platform on a stage in a room. And it's a different skill set than being in front of a camera and presenting, right? That kind of TV host energy is a little bit different but Jane has both. And so she would present this thing. And then, yeah, it was, it was a prompt that would ask people to think about what they would do in the first five minutes after a particular scenario was presented to them. Like after you realize the power is out and your cell phone's dead, this was one scenario and she talked through it and then gave people five minutes to type in the chat. What would you do if you were in that situation? It's related to this thing called specificity training. It has this sort of other elements to it, but, but it's a simple activity ultimately. And yeah, just seeing everybody in the chat coming out after that was so, I mean, it was like, it was, because that, even that too, seeing other people answering the prompt you're answering at the same time, I think was another thing that combined with the physical sensation they'd had just before really made people feel like, oh yeah, I'm here with these other people. We're all doing something together. Yeah. Um, and even if that activity itself is 
it does, it's so simple in, in its formation and necessarily simple so that everybody can do it, um, that it was still really powerful. And the power of it, um, it was a lot of lessons for me. I think, you know, traditionally we try to make our experiences somewhat um, sophisticated so that people feel like they're, they're not too simple, but learning like the, sim that's not a problem. So a simple experiences that people can do, doing them together if they have some kind of outcome, super, super powerful. Yeah. Um, we also had this daily journey that was a part of each of them. That was one of the highlights for me as well was we got to do things like um, some of them were pre-recorded and we just aired them like they were live, but we did one that was an underwater drone in Monterey Bay and, and on the California coast where we had this underwater drone in the ocean uh, streaming out what it was doing. So we were going like on a tour of the ocean from our homes live. Um, cool. You know, those kinds of things. There's so many fun things you can do by taking advantage of the fact that because you're not in the same room, you can take advantage of the fact that everybody is, is somewhere interesting potentially. I mean, yeah. Thank you, Dylan. We have another question here on the chat. Number, what was the number of attendees? How did you handle ticket pricing? They're, uh, they're struggling with opening up numbers and with what to charge compared to in person. Do you have any sense of what's the sweet spot? Yeah, so um, uh, let me see this. Yeah, so yeah, I can share this. Um, so this was our largest event that we've ever had. Um, so we normally these events that we do, they're elaborate, but they're intimate, right? Because we can only scale the event so large. So they, we normally get about three to 400 people at our event. That's the scale that we're normally working with. Um, and we do it in person. It feels like a big room when you're in it. Um, so we, by opening it up to 10 seats per partner, we had 225 of just our partners registering, just our sponsors, um, which itself was a record for our, our client participation. Um, and we, so we have a different model, right? So I, we're still experimenting with this. So I, I don't have necessarily an answer that will translate directly into everybody's needs, but because we bundle our event into this other offerings that we have. So people are buying into a suite of services from us um, as a part of our revenue um, and to sponsor our work and they get early access to the work. And so that we have a traditional model around that that has tickets bundled into it. And so we haven't done as much with specific just like having the, the revenue of the event come just from the event itself as much but this is, has given us the first sort of ability to think about that in a way that we might really do so what we did was we have a big relatively big kind of newsletter and audience and a community of alumni from our training and different things like this and so we initially released 500 free tickets which didn't have the future readiness package and where we because vantage point we didn't want to like crew could handle like hundreds and hundreds of folks, but we weren't sure if they were gonna be able to handle thousands depending on if we like opened it up really big. And so we were nervous about that. What we were able to do with YouTube live streaming is for the overflow of that provide just the YouTube link for folks. So they still got all of the content, but they that, that we weren't worried about scaling issues. So we really didn't have to worry about the cost of that because the per seat cost didn't increase for us. So we, we first opened up 500 free tickets just to see uh, and those were claimed within 90 minutes, which was amazing to us. Um, and then we opened up this tier and we got 1600 registrants just from our newsletter and uh, IPF network. So that was, and, and just to give you a sense of that, like that's the highest response rate we've ever had for anything like that. We have like, you know, like a lot of folks, we have a few thousand folks in our newsletter audience, um, but normally the open rate's pretty low and the response rate's pretty low. A lot of people jumped at this. We did offer some VIP tickets to folks who asked first. So we provided a little incentive on that. But what we didn't do was like turn the tap all the way open. We didn't promote this broadly on social media because it was an experiment. We didn't want, we didn't know what we could handle, right? It was the first time doing this. We didn't, we certainly didn't promote it on social media or buy ads against it or, or publicize it anywhere publicly other than to our newsletter audience. So we don't even know what the actual demand would have been if we'd done that. We're, we're looking to find that out in 2021 with some events that we plan on taking this format further towards. But I think by having an audience that we already had some, that had some interest in our work by offering different tiers of tickets. And I think that might be the key, you know, is figuring out how your different tiers of, of sponsors of the event maybe can work because you can, you can attract a lot of people to an event for free. And I think probably like there's orders of magnitude more people that will maybe come to an event that's free than that costs a dollar, right? There's like that immediate barrier as soon as it costs something and there's a transaction in the middle, then people are like, well, I don't know. They, it's like just hard enough to, caught, to pay for something online that they won't do it. But if you have a dedicated group that can help sponsor the cost of the event overall, 
and you can offer sort of more experiences to them. That, that was sort of our approach. So we have a dedicated group of folks that we know are, are invested in sponsoring uh, our work and invested in us. And so we wanted to try to provide as much value for them as possible through things like the box, through these insight sessions in that second week, through lots of other things that we made a little bit more exclusive, but which allowed the, the meat of the content to be public and free, um, which aligned with our nonprofit mission and still met our financial goals. Um, and so, yeah, we had 2000 registrants show up. We had, we, in the end, we had over 700 people attend the event at various points. And we had like, I think like the average was close to like three to 400 simultaneous participants at any given time. Um, and that didn't flag that much that like was pretty consistent across it, which was uh, staggering to us, honestly. I expected a lot more ups and downs over the course of the week. Even in person, the last day shows some attrition, which so it was surprising that it was not the case for you all. Yeah, normally you would expect to see that drop off significantly. And yeah, there was a little bit, maybe we went down to an average of like 250 or something towards the afternoon of the last day on a Friday. Um, but we were around 400 plus for most of the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. um, of people, yeah, just willing to sit in front of their computer and participate in this because the experience was engaging enough for them. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah we, we have a comment here on the chat from Jeanette saying like, like having a VIP level, partner level and a public level. Jeanette, do you want to unmute? Is there anything else you want to add? To, to your comment? Yeah, I guess, so what, just trying to address our struggles at our um, event, it's normally we have 50 people, um, which is what we can accommodate at our offices for a special day to, before the conference kickoff, or it's kind of actually, um, I guess it is the kickoff for those 50 people, mm -hmm. but then we open it up and I think it's like 300 attendees for the next mm -hmm. three, is it two days or three days, Allison? Three, yeah. So it's a long thing. I liked what you said about extending it to one week. That, so mm -hmm. that sounds interesting because we were actually thinking about scaling back to one day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just don't know. Um, we have UX research, which are very interactive. And so I guess I'm just trying to figure out, A, how do we get the participation rates for that research and those models we normally do, which are really fun and engaging? Um, it sounds like you had a lot of really cool ideas. Um, but the other part was, you know, we usually charge a big ticket for this. Mm -hmm. So now what is the, you know, what, based off what value you're providing, how do you know what to charge? So this is like a three tier <laughs> question. And then the next thing I was curious is what about next year or 2022 or 23? Do you stick with this model or do you ever go back to in person or so that's yeah. a lot. All good questions. I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I'll answer them in the order that it occurs to me, if that's all right. Um, so just on the pricing model. So I think, you know, we've had a lot of conversations internally, I'm sure y'all have as well, about sort of this kind of zero paced pricing sort of idea, like nobody knows, like everything's so disrupted and sort of the table turned over that all of our pricing assumptions have been kind of turned upside down. So we've been exploring that and trying to figure that out. And we've had in, you know, a lot of what we do is also in in-person workshops and events. That's a lot of the services that we provide that make up our revenue. And so obviously in the first part of the pandemic, we had to, that, that all got tossed. And then we started to try to deliver them online. And we have found that the, the, the value we can provide um, through di the digital offerings in our workshops um, in particularly has crept back up, like that we've been able to sort of get close to the kind of cost models that we had before. And that I think folks are starting to, if they had budgets for that kind of thing before, they're starting to adjust around that. Um, I think one, you know, for particularly with the live events, like depending on how much of the revenue from the event that you're charging is to pay for the event, it's the logistics itself. I think that there's an opportunity to, you know, for in our case, like our, what we, what, what our um, sponsorship fee is for our, the, the, for Vantage um, program did not change. And so what we tried to do is we tried to take the fact that the costs were different to provide more to them, right? So I think that, that that's one approach to take is you charge the same amount, but maybe now that's worth, if you're doing it only online, maybe that can be worth 10 tickets and you can invite a whole team of folks to work together on it and you can have more sessions around it because you're not paying for that physical venue or that AV team or that catering company, right? All these fixed costs that suddenly get eliminated, which are such a substantial part of events um, and uh, such a huge part of that. So. So you, I, I think you could probably take that either way, right? Like whether 
like just knowing that those costs aren't necessarily there if you're doing it all digital, you can lower the ticket price or you can provide more value for the same ticket price. So I think that's that's kind of how we approached it and how we're continuing to think about approaching it. And I think for us too, like thinking of the event as marketing itself for what we do was another kind of aha moment that we had where because once we had paid for the infrastructure of streaming, um, which again was like 40% cost reduction, which included all of our, you know, a lot of that cost is honorariums for folks we're inviting, all of these kinds of costs that also were lower because it's a lot easier to ask somebody to, to call into a conference for a panel for an hour than to fly out for a day to attend it in person, right? So we were able to get people that we wanted um, as speakers a little bit more easily because the ask was less and, and that cost wasn't quite as high, although certainly we, we wanted to fairly compensate people for their time and, and make them feel excited to participate in it with us. Um, and so by having all of those costs change up, yeah, it just, it, it, it allows that to work differently and it allows us to add the 501 through 1000th seat for free. And we created a different tier actually on Vantage Point on crew for the folks that are our VIPs that are, are, are paying sponsors and for the folks that were maybe prospective sponsors of us or, or folks that we had reached out to that weren't paying for anything. We actually gave them a version of the experience that because it was a digital platform, we didn't give them all of the things we would offer normally to our partners, including all of our research releases and all of those things. We just gave them a, a sort of a tailored experience that was the full experience of the event, but that also kind of allowed us to put in some communications and messaging around what you could get if you did sponsor us and, and for the rest of the year. So it was sort of like, you know, I think in a way that we provided a lot of value to those folks and it was sort of, it became a marketing channel for us to sort of talk about, yeah, to, to sort of get in front of prospects. Um, and so that was another way to think about the benefit of it is that it's like free, the, the event becomes a, a, you know, double counts as a marketing cost. Um, mm. And um Dylan, we have two minutes left. Just maybe do you want to share what about what are you thinking for 2021? Yeah, that's where I was going to go. That's great. Thanks. So um, for 2021, what we're planning right now is we are tentatively planning to do this same, probably mostly online model, but we're actually thinking about breaking it out. We want to do some experiments. So we're thinking in the fall that we're going to do probably a three-day version of the five-day thing that we did this year, because we think that's probably about right for what, what we were, the, the level of, of engagement we were asking for folks. Um, we're still gonna do the box. The box was a big winner. That's like, a, I think a big thing that drives people there. Um, and, but we're also experimenting with some smaller events that we normally do becoming one day kind of events in the same format. So we're gonna do an event in February that's public. And we're gonna do another one in May that are gonna be experiments in seeing how much further can we actually reduce the internal costs of putting this on and maybe do some of that streaming work internally and, and see if we can make this something that we can turn into a kind of a turnkey event uh, opportunity for us whenever we wanna do something and invite the public. Like when we do a big research release uh, or when, which, which is what the February and May ones will be about when we, we uh, like launch different things, can we bring a few, uh, one day's programming into that same format and invite folks, have it be, have, a, have the internal cost be less, but have that the same benefits of the online. And if we do an, a hybrid model, we are thinking it'll probably be smaller and, and digital first, because we also anticipate for 2021, we're a futures organization, we anticipate that travel budgets are not gonna snap back next year, even if COVID restrictions allow for it. Mm -hmm. And that likely, that, that whole conference model, it, it, I think it's an open question whether that, what, what, what form that takes going forward, right? I think that as everybody's learned how to do things digital and getting used to it, I think it's gonna become more common. And I think for the folks that we had that were able to justify spending on flying out to a conference before getting that that expense justified to fly out to california is likely to be harder for folks mm -hmm. and and we we don't want to give up the the bigger reach that we we had this year so we are currently anticipating that we might make a, a hard pivot to doing much more of our work digital first thank you thank you thanks so much dylan and thank you everybody for for joining us we're at time i don't know dylan if you have five minutes to stick around if anyone yeah. else wants to share, share a question but if you need to go uh, thanks again. Um, I'll type here on the chat my email. If you want to reach out for anything, if you would like a demo of crew or questions even for Dylan that we can send this way, um, we're, we're happy to follow up and, and yes. And I can, I can stick around for a few minutes for any other questions. Happy to do that. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute and pop in.
Dylan, what did the back end, um, can you explain that a little bit more and how you had the different screens or like how you were? Yeah, jumping? how we were like conducting the show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that was all Zoom actually. So that was, that was the interesting thing about it is it, particularly for, you know, there's a lot of different options we could have used for it. Um, but Zoom we went with because it is the one that everybody's using and has, and it's like not a big ask of uh, somebody who's just gonna be attending a panel or they're an expert in something that's totally different. And we, we're just taking an hour from their day to participate. So it was this um, process that involved like very much like a regular kind of Zoom webinar like this. We had two Zoom rooms that were run by our streaming team. Uh, one was called the green room. And so that was the one that when panelists and hosts would come together like 20 minutes before their session or show was about to start, they'd all meet, we'd test audio. We would do all that kind of sanity checking on making sure everybody looked good um, and sounded good. And then when it was time to go on stage, we had a stage Zoom room and people would move into that. We had a, a coordinator that would help everybody make sure they're good to go. Uh, we, would, we were in and out of that room ask, answering any questions with our participants because we wanted this to be really smooth. We wanted to have all this back end stuff happen on the back end and not on, on the screen, right? Um, uh, so all the things around sharing and like all the stuff that's kind of like futzy about Zoom, we like kind of hid. And then we had this uh, live room and once folks were in there, they just were acting like we're acting like right now but what our team was doing behind us, and this may or may not be worth it for you, but it was really beneficial for us for this sense we were trying to give that this was a TV broadcast you were watching, is that they were actually, um, and you can use software to do this, they were pulling the different boxes like the, that we have in Zoom here onto, into a different piece of software that was then um, more like a kind of a video switching software. So like the kind of thing you would use in like a live TV broadcast so that they would have that. I don't know if anybody's ever like kind of familiar with the chatter of a live TV broadcast, but sort of like, okay, ready on three, prepare three, go three, ready on six, ready six, go six. Like that, that kind of thing where we have a bunch of different options at any time of close-ups of the person speaking or a two-up shot that was designed. So it had our branding and it had our feel and it had the event, the feeling of each show in it. So each one sort of also felt a little different, um, felt more like maybe a panel show on TV would. Um, so pulling those things together then like knowing when the show is over, okay, now go to the uh, animation that we show between shows. Now go to this fake commercial. Now go to the next host for, you know, so, so that, that was all happening in a, this stage Zoom room. And, but what people were seeing on the YouTube feed was just what was the kind of output of that. So it didn't create any extra work for our, our um, like panelists or our hosts who are not necessarily media people at all with those literacies but it allowed, and it actually allowed them to focus more on what they're doing because they weren't trying to control a digital interface. They were just talking um, like they would and they could focus on their content. And then we kind of took that burden off of them um, and, and made it um, a little bit more elaborate. But like I said, I think there's, we're, we're experimenting next year with what's, what's sort of a, a midway point of that. How do we make it a little bit easier for us to just host this thing without a, an external team that we're hiring uh, to help us? Um, while still getting that value of it feeling just more kind of like a performance um, in some ways than and something that sort of has, you know, like that stage kind of feeling to it where you, you feel like you're getting something that's a little more polished as, a, as an audience participant. Dylan, this is Janet. Um, the idea that you've put out there about having a producer or a director is obviously brilliant. Like I, I, that didn't even occur to me. Um, now, is that kind of part of crew's package or is that just you guys internally running your own that yeah. was I mean we we collaborated very deeply with crew because this was like their first time doing something like this on uh -huh. the platform as well um, but that was uh, us that was us sort of with our project team our event team which is you know like I say this event's a big deal for us so we always spent, put a lot of resources towards it and we always have kind of our event team and I'm the producer of that I, I happen to have a media background which is why these dots were ah, okay. me. <laughs> and so I as soon as we were reaching these limitations I was like oh we should like pull out the old media toolkit and, and start doing this. But I do think it's it's definitely something that you can bring a contractor in for. Anybody who's done, like the, the same folks, honestly, that you would hire for AV at a venue are now mostly all doing this. I think we, we were a little bit early on it, but everybody's moving in this direction. So I think any team that you would normally hire to like switch the slides and, and run the lights at a venue, okay. At this they would point have now, a producer that you could contract. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And they would have somebody that's now probably been doing things more, more and more like this over the last six months. And, and that I bet that those services, as they're trying to figure out the value of what they're offering, um, they're, they're moving more in this direction, uh, mm -hmm. most of them. 
Yeah, exactly. And what crew did was simply house the the live stream of what was being produced all on the back end from Dylan and the production team that he had and all of the speakers and so on. So you would, which I think is the question, Marty, that you shared um, for all these elements was the login on crew. Was it helpful to have everybody in a home place like crew, which I would say the answer is yes. Um, Dylan, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that question. Uh, no, unless there's other nuances of it that somebody would, yeah. would like to ask. Pretty straightforward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so everything went off. Sorry, it's loud behind me. But like, so everything, all the different components, basically, you had the links going off so that people just had one login. Is exactly. that where you yeah, let exactly. It? So everybody, every session, everything was bringing everybody just into crew. And then we, the what crew was, was able to provide for us, that is a part of the service that the live services offer, is it's now set up to do this so that you can have that main dashboard you go to tell you what sessions currently live. You can also send a link directly to the session, but you don't have to. So mm -hmm. what we wanted to do was make it so that you could um, get more clever with it. But if you didn't, then the easiest path, however you came in through the door, would take you to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. um, so that people wouldn't get, we, we were really sensitive to people getting lost or confused in any way um, by, uh, by using a new platform to experience an event. And um, I think, I think, yeah, we, we were amazed at, yeah, how few people had issues with that. I think it's, you know, part of it is, is the only thing that people had to do was register for it, which they received an invitation when they registered for the event, create their username and password. Um, and then everything that was, everything was geared towards the event while they were on the platform for that week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of became our partner portal again. So it sort of, it, it sort of was like this, it was a, it was a cool thing because it's, it wasn't a conference specific platform that people will then not use anymore. It, it's a platform we want to drive our sponsors to and our users um, because it's where all of our deliverables are. And then it sort of like kind of uh, elevated itself into this like event mode during that week that then it could kind of become its regular use case. So we were also reinforcing user behavior that um, we, we want to as a program um, help support anyway. Yep, thank you. So cool, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dylan. Thanks for the questions too, Marty. Um, Veronica, I don't think we've heard much from you today. How are you? <laughs> yeah, no, this has been so, so fascinating and just kind of emerging into this new digital climate where we're using these different platforms in a centralized, you know, in a centralized space where the participants of the conference doesn't have to be, you know, inundated by the complications of what, you know, the production crew is juggling like that. That's, that's what I took away from, you know, from, from this webinar and just kind of how to make it a seamless experience. So I don't have any questions right now, but I'm I'm sure that you know as I percolate with with this webinar, I, I will and I, I might I might reach out. So yeah, thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you again, Dylan. Thank you, Marty, for helping us organize, and thank you all for joining. I hope you have a, a good day and reach out if you if you'd like to continue the conversation. So thank awesome. you. Thanks, awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Thanks for hosting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Kelly.